。但係其實已經失去咗啦。Over in Babylon, the language was Aramaic. 因為喺巴比倫佢哋所用嘅誒、呃、語言咧係阿拉伯。And this may be the origin of giving an oral translation and commentary when the Bible is read. 咁呢個可能咧就係誒聖經我哋去誒用一個口述口譯嘅形式嘅一個誒識經嘅一個例子嚟嘅最早出現嘅情況嚟嘅。The person that was doing this was known as a targumist or a metrogaman. 咁喺當時做緊呢個過程嘅人咧，最主要誒就佢哋就係他爾根。Which is what Ivan is doing right now. Now, in time, these initially these were done only orally. These could not be written down. But in time, they came to be written down. And so the targums are important translations and paraphrases or commentaries on the scriptures. 咁所以當時去收集出嚟嘅卡爾根呢個譯本咧，其實就係等於佢哋一個好重要嘅一個誒，幫助我哋學習嘅翻譯同識經嘅一個版本。Still widely used by Bible scholars today。直至今日咧，好多聖經嘅學者咧都仍然去採用呢個版本嘅。We've been speaking about the translation of the Old Testament into Greek。咁甚至我哋而家講話將舊約去譯做希臘文啦。And now it's time to tell its story. We talk about it, or we call it the Septuagint, but notice the word "the" is in quotation marks. Then we see in English, it is talking about the Septuagint. Then the English word "the" is in quotation marks. Because it is not just one book. 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 Because This is actually his area of research. The story goes. And we read the story in the letter of Aristeas, as it's called. That the Ptolemies, who are kings of Egypt, Are collecting books for the great library at Alexandria. And they hear that the Jews up in the land of Judah have a sacred book that must be included. So they send to the land of Judah and ask for manuscripts of this book. And scholars who can translate it into Greek. And so six Jewish scholars are sent from each tribe, seventy-two in all. 咁所以喺十二個支派裏邊咧，每一個支派就派咗六個學者去，咁所以總共係七十二位學者去做呢個翻譯。They come to the land of Egypt and produce a Greek translation of the Bible。咁所以佢哋一齊咧就去到埃及咯，就喺當地咧就去將聖經去翻譯成希臘文。It is read out loud and everyone agrees that it is wonderful。咁所以佢哋翻譯完又會讀出嚟啦，大家都同意啦，咁啊呢個就佢覺得係好好嘅翻譯啦。In fact, they say it is so excellent that they pronounce a curse on anyone who ever changes a word. In time, this story becomes even stranger. Philo of Alexandria adds the detail that the translators all agree. 咁甚至係全文咧，當時喺翻譯嘅時候，佢哋作每個人所做出嚟嘅翻譯本咧，係所有在場嘅學者係一致嘅。That this translation is itself inspired。咁所以佢哋就話啊，甚至呢個翻譯本咧，都係聖靈所默示嘅。Then by the fourth century, the church father Epiphanius adds more details。咁去到發展到去四世紀嘅時候，誒、呃、個學者。
學分唔出。啊，他我收係，佢咧就會更，佢有個更，佢有個再得到一個另外一個結論。He says the scholars go off two by two into different rooms。咁佢就話當時咧，其實啲學者咧係兩個兩個咁去咗唔同嘅房間裏邊。Then they come back and compare their work。咁佢哋就話咧，誒，每個人喺自己房間做完出嚟之後咧，去每個人去比較嘅時候咧。And they discover that everyone's translation was identical。咁佢又話：所有人去做出嚟嘅翻譯咧，係完全一致。Which is quite a ridiculous story。咁其實依個真其實都係冇乜可能發生嘅故事嚟嘅。We don't believe any such thing is true。咁我哋唔係好相信依依件事係真嘅。But it shows something important。咁但係顯示咗一樣好重要嘅。Which is that people at that time were wrestling with this question。即係話當時嘅人咧，其實都喺度掙扎緊呢個問題。Can a translation be the word of God? 就係話翻譯究竟係唔係上帝嘅話語啦 ？And their answer was different from ours. 咁但係佢哋嘅答案同我哋而家今日嘅答案唔一樣。Their answer was yes because our translation is an inspired translation. 因為佢哋嘅答案係話誒譯翻譯本係等同上帝話語，因為翻譯都係聖靈所默示，上帝所默示嘅。Now one person very important in the history of the church who believed this story. Entirely was Saint Augustine. 咁咧就係呢個故事咧，我哋喺誒聖經歷史裏邊咧，我哋有一個好重要嘅誒人物咧，佢係喺佢一生之中都相信呢個故事嘅，就係誒聖啊奧古斯丁。And Saint Augustine was a great man, but I have one thing against him. 其實奧古斯丁佢係一個好偉大嘅人物，誒，但我只有一樣嘢唔同意佢。He loved the Septuagint so much. 咁佢非常之中意呢套聖經本。That he said, learning Hebrew is a waste of time. 咁佢就話咧，所以你學希伯來文咧就係浪費時間。He said Greek is all you need. 你淨係需要希伯來文嚟㗎嘛。Because he said, if the the Septuagint was good enough for the writers of the New Testament, it should be good enough for us. 咁佢就話，如果個七十四本去對新約嘅時代嘅作者都係足夠嘅話，其實對我哋嚟講已經足夠啦。In this, he was opposed by Saint Jerome. 咁當時喺誒。聖耶耶油米啦，佢係個主教啦。And he is the area of Dr. Thompson's research。咁佢咧就係啊，我哋嘅唐建倫教授嘅研究範圍啦。Jerome said no, we need to go back to the Hebrew if we want to know what the original actually said。咁耶油米佢就話，如果當我哋要知道上帝所講話語咧，就我哋得翻翻去希伯來文。So in this respect, he is a very great man。所以我哋好尊重佢一個好偉大嘅人物。Now, when he described his way of translating, 咁當我哋去描誒去形容佢所講嘅翻譯嘅時候咧 ，Jerome made this distinction. 咁佢對翻譯佢就以下嘅見解 ，which he had probably already received from the classical author Cicero. 咁可能佢已經係當時佢誒誒呢個 Cicero, I can't help you, but I'm sorry. Yes, sorry, I haven't checked anything. 係關於個學者佢嘅誒理解。Jerome said, "When you're a translator, you have two options." 咁係你作為個譯者嘅時候咧，你有兩個嘅選擇。He said, "You can translate word for word or sense for sense." 你就係可以係逐字嘅直譯啦，或者係全意嘅翻譯。And he said, "I chose to do the latter to translate sense for sense." 咁佢就話佢就建議係呢個意譯嘅。So the result would be a Bible people can understand. 咁所以咧個目標咧就係希望。聖經嘅讀者係可以明白。In a way, this was unfortunate。咁其實咧，亦都有依個嘅誒，亦都有帶嚟一啲不幸。Because the truth is, there are not only two ways to translate。因為翻譯嘅唔係淨係得依兩種方法。But the whole discussion about translating kind of got stuck here。咁但係好多討論關於翻譯嘅討論咧，就若果就停留真喺依個依兩樣嘢嘅爭論上。And remain there for actually more than a thousand years. 其實喺依個層面上咧，爭論咗超過一千年。Jerome's translation, of course, became known as the Vulgate. 咁喺誒耶路米佢嘅翻譯本咧，就係我哋都好熟悉嘅母加大譯本啦。And in time, it was judged so superior by the Roman Catholic Church. 咁亦都係喺羅馬誒天主教裏邊咧，係非常之誒承認嘅一個版本。That it became their authentic translation of the Bible. 就成為佢哋所誒。公認嘅正統嘅聖經譯本啦。And the study of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek original languages fell by the wayside for a while. It became de-emphasized. 
。咁所以當佢成為一個主流嘅譯本嘅時候咧，當時令到好長時間咧，有關於聖經原文，即係讀希臘文啊、亞臘文同希伯來文咧，就令好多人都擺埋一邊啦。Until the time of the Renaissance and then the Reformation。咁直至到誒、呃、文藝復興時代同埋到到宗教改革時代啦。And here we have opportunity to talk about Luther's great work of translating the Bible. 咁我哋就可以有機會去講講關於馬丁路德喺佢從事聖經翻譯嘅一啲偉大工作。That's actually the Wartburg Castle in Germany. 咁呢一個就係誒威威丁堡嘅華丁堡嘅誒個城堡啦，喺德國嘅。Which you can still visit this day. 咁其實而家你仲可以去個地方去參觀嘅。And this is where Luther did his initial work of Bible translating. 咁依係誒馬丁路德佢直係喺呢個城堡裏邊咧誒開始佢嘅翻譯工作。The New Testament began in 1521. 咁佢翻譯新約咧就喺五二一年開始啦。And the rest of the Bible followed later. 咁係整本聖經咧就會係之後後啲嘅時代完成嘅。But Luther kept revising his Bible translation almost until the day of his death. 咁但係馬丁路德佢其實從終其一生咧，直至佢死之前咧，其實佢不停都對佢嘅翻譯作出修改。And a lot of it he was never entirely happy with。但係其實佢可以講話，佢一直都唔係非常之滿意嘅。But its impact was enormous。咁但係佢嘅工作嘅影響咧，就非常之巨大啦。Sometimes people think that Luther's was the first translation into the German language。咁好多人都以為咧，馬丁路德係第一個將聖經翻譯成德文。But it actually was not. But it actually was not. It was, I believe, number 18. But it was different in two ways. It was made from the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. Instead of being a translation of the Vulgate, in other words, a translation of a translation. 咁佢就唔係用誒冇加大譯本去譯啦，即係變相就唔係用翻譯緊另外一個翻譯本啦。And the second thing is that Luther's was the first German Bible translated into the kind of language that people really spoke。咁另外一個重要嘅元素就話，佢當時佢所選用嘅德文嘅翻譯咧，其實係當時嘅人民嘅日常嘅語言。And as a result, it had a huge impact on the German language. 咁所以咧，相對地，佢對即係德國誒德文一個語言同文化嘅發展咧嘅影響都好巨大。In fact, it's sometimes said that Luther really created the modern German language by giving the German people a common Bible. 咁亦都有人話，因為馬丁路德為當時一啲嘅平民啦，佢譯咗個聖德文嘅聖經翻譯本咧，亦都將一個誒德文一個誒帶嚟一個新嘅現象嘅。And it also had a great impact on later Bible translations. 但而且同時，佢嘅翻譯咧就對往後一啲嘅聖經嘅翻譯咧有深遠嘅影響。Including the English King James version that we'll talk about in a moment。咁亦都包括對往後咧英文嘅英皇音定本嘅翻譯咧有好大影響。Now fortunately, Luther describes his philosophy of translating in great detail。咁亦都阿馬丁路德佢描述佢自己嘅翻譯嘅原則嘅時候咧，都有一啲嘅誒可以分享嘅地方。And he says there are times when one word has just supreme importance. 咁就係話，當我哋翻譯嘅過程裏邊，牽涉到一個字係非常非常之重要嘅時候。And at those times, he said, I proceeded in a very literal way. 咁佢就會係用好字面上字係誒逐字去直譯出嚟嘅。He said the rest of the time, this was my job. 佢話大部分我哋就都係要咁樣去做。He said he studied the original texts until he knew what they meant. 因為佢話我要去研讀去原文所講嘅，直至到我明白。And then he put them aside。跟住佢就放埋一邊啦。And said, how would a German person say this？ 跟住就諗一諗，究竟德國人佢哋會點樣去講呢句説話咧 ？And he asked people on the farms and in the street。咁佢就去到誒農地上啊，甚至喺街上去問人啦。For instance, when he was translating the book of Leviticus。咁當佢去譯誒利未記嘅時候。He got to the part that describes the animal sacrifices. 咁佢就退咗一部分咧，係講關於動物獻祭嘅過程。So to get the language just right, he went to the butcher shop. 咁佢要因為佢想用一個啱嘅語言咧，佢甚至去到賣肉嘅地方。And he watched the butcher cut up a cow. 咁佢就睇到個肉箱啊
And he asked the butcher, what do you call that piece? And what do you call that piece? So that he could get the prophets to speak German. In terms of his philosophy of translating, Luther was remarkably far ahead of his time. And as I mentioned, he had an impact also on Bibles in English. Although not so much on the philosophy of translating used by the greatest of them all, the King James Version. We won't tell the story of this one in detail, but there are some things we should mention about it. Because as I mentioned, I lived through the time when we began to put this version aside. And we listened to many people offer strong opinions about the virtues of this Bible. Sometimes these opinions were not based on fact. For instance, this Bible translation was published in 1611. So people say, well, that must have been how they talked. Actually, the language of the King James Version was already out of date in 1611. Because the translators said, after all, the Bible is an old book. So we should make it sound old. <laughs> this one was something you heard very often. The second person pronoun in the King James Version is often the and thou. And people say, I like that. Because that is dignified language. It, it shows respect and politeness. This is the way we should speak about God. The truth is exactly the opposite. At this time, the reverent or polite form was you. And thou was the form that you used to talk to your children or to your friends. But the important thing is that people associated this language with the Bible. And they got it into their minds that this is how the Bible should sound. Then you often heard this remark. I remember one gentleman who said, I just don't like change. And I want a Bible that has always been the same. Truth is, the King James has been changing constantly. But in the experience of many people, it has been frozen in time, you could say. Here are some reasons why change has been necessary. This is the story of Rahab the prostitute. And when the people of Jericho come looking for the Israelite spies, this is what she says. Ask a person who speaks English every day what whist and what mean, and they will have no idea. <laughs> This is from an old English verb, to wit, which means to know. 
It's nice to say, I wished not Wednesday were with her and went, I watched not, but nobody talks that way anymore. This is one of my personal favorites. In the King James Version, he says, first of all, you should lay apart your filthiness. In English today, we don't lay things apart anymore. But you should put aside any superfluity of naughtiness. Now we still use this word naughty. But naughty is when your child misbehaves. Naughtiness at this time meant evil. There are many similar examples. Now what is the point we're trying to make? Are we saying this was a bad translation? Not at all. It was a very good translation. But was is the important word. It no longer serves God's people very well. But it is an important fact of English Bibles. And so it has had a very large effect on all Bible translations since. One, the New King James is a very slight update to its language. There have been more thorough updates, but they still retain most of the King James features. Although the NASB is considerably different in some ways. And even the, the New International Version, the NIV that I spoke of earlier, shows signs at times that the translators have the King James Version in their mind. And this is another difficulty in Bible translating. Once you get a translation in your head, it's almost impossible to get it out. And to do work that is completely fresh is very difficult. But sometimes it's necessary. Why do translations change? We could divide the reasons into reasons that have to do with the original texts, the source side. And then reasons that have to do with the language into which we are translating. That would be the target side. Reasons that have to do with the original texts would be these. Sometimes there are new manuscript finds. The students in the textual criticism class will now list them for you from memory. <laughs> no, that would be to punish them for coming tonight. I won't do that. <laughs> but uh, usually these changes are very slight. But they can be noticeable. But as scholarship progresses, we do learn new things sometimes about the biblical languages and the cultures. And 
But changes for these reasons are usually less significant or noticeable. Than reasons that have to do with the language into which we are translating. Once we have figured out what it says, then we have to think carefully about how do we have to say it in our language. And that is so you don't do things like this. This is a road sign. What is the problem here? Invisibility is when I suddenly disappear and you can't see me. It doesn't mean that I can't see you. Or that I can't see to drive. Would you enjoy some lemon tea called a break on the desk? The problem is it sounds like you're supposed to take the tea and do this. <laughs> or this sign has these directions to find the toilet. The person meant to say to go back where you came from. But in English, to go backwards is to do this. I don't think it's a good idea to walk toward the toilet that way. Here is the point. All languages have profound differences in their structures. And if you, as a translator, you are simply going to maintain the structures of the original language in the translation, the best possible result is that you will sound really strange. The worst result is that you will communicate something completely incorrect. Here's an example of why. This has to do with the meanings of words. Very common word in the Greek New Testament. Parakaleo, when you look up this word in a dictionary, if it's a good Greek dictionary, it will list these meanings. The one thing it does not mean is to promote or foster something. Now, most Greek dictionaries will give the English word encourage as the first meaning for this Greek verb. Now, look up the word encourage in an English dictionary. It never means summon. It never means that. It can mean to urge and it can mean to cheer up. So do these words mean the same thing? Sometimes. There is some overlap. But if you simply substitute this word, every time you see this word when you're translating the Bible, most of the time you will be simply wrong. Then there is this aspect of the meaning of words. My wife likes to cook. So suppose I come in the kitchen. And she's making dinner. 
I will get one reaction if I say, what is that smell? I will get another reaction if I say, what is that fragrance? If I really want a nice reaction, I can say, what is that aroma? I will get a very different reaction if I say, what's that odor? <laughs> and if I ask, what is that stench? I will probably be invited to find dinner somewhere else. <laughs> now, all these words mean smell. But their connotations, their emotional impact is very different. And when you are learning a language that is not your mother tongue, this is usually the last thing you learn. What we are saying is this. A word is just a tip of a whole iceberg of knowledge. And most of the knowledge of, that this word carries with it is under the surface. You can't see it. But as a native speaker of your language, this word can bring up this knowledge for you. Then there's also the matter of syntax, so the arrangement of word and sentences. Here's Genesis 1, verse 1. A word for word translation would be something like this. First of all, you have to go the correct direction. And you would say something like that. Which is not even really a translation. Now, if you were creating a Bible for someone who was trying to learn Hebrew, for such a person, this might be useful. But for almost anybody else, it would be useless. Here's John 3.16. And there's a literal translation of it. Good luck understanding that. So the same thing would be true. Maybe useful for Greek language learning, but not for much else. And here's an aspect of word meanings that is much studied recently. The science of pragmatics has to do with what we are trying to accomplish with our words. An important book in this subject is called Jane Austen's book, How to Do Things with Words. The point is that our words do not simply carry information. They actually do things. For instance, if I say to my translator, thank you. I just thanked her. That wasn't just information, I actually did what I said. Or what about in a wedding ceremony? 
When the person officiating says, I now pronounce you man and wife. He has actually done the thing he is saying. Or is this example? Do you know someone who, when you ask that person, how are you? They actually tell you. <laughs> and they say, well, when I got up this morning, I felt pretty good. And then I had a nice breakfast, and I came to work. And right now I'm starting to feel a little hungry. And they go on and on about how they are. What they have failed to understand is that in English, how are you is not a question. It's simply a greeting. Now, if I am in the hospital and you come to visit me, and you say, Dr. Cherney, how are you? Now I might tell you. <laughs> because the purpose for the for the words is derived from the situation. This gets even more complicated. If I come to your house, and you ask me if I want a drink. And I say thank you. And that's all I say. Do I want the drink or don't I? People always disagree about this in English. <laughs> because I think in English the answer varies. Mm. I used to be a missionary in Brazil. And in Portuguese, if I say thank you, and that's all I say.